Okay, great. Now that the uh, Brooklyn Law School contingent has arrived, we can get started. So, so uh, it's, it's, it, this is the second time Doug is speaking to this class, and uh, what's, what I'm hoping will be a tradition, he's coming for the second time in a row the day after the election, the day after things probably changed quite a bit in this country. Um, so, you know, when I was uh, just getting into this stuff, um, well, just getting back into thinking about uh, some of the societal issues that uh, my industry um, affects. Uh, some of the work that I was reading uh, was by Doug, Rush Doug Rushkoff, and um, one particular book that he wrote that I, I really loved is a book he wrote called Coercion, um, I guess about the, the advertising uh, business, and I, it, was, it, it really had an impact on me, and probably is part of the reason why I actually teach this class. And hmm. what's really cool about this class is sometimes I get to use it as an excuse to meet people like Doug. And uh, you know, Doug's a media theorist, he is also an educator, he teaches at ITP, and he's just a, an all-around great guy, and uh, I'm really looking forward to his talk today. Today he'll be talking about his new book, Program or Be Programmed, which you could get at this website at orbooks.com. And uh, that's enough for me. Let's hear from Doug. Yeah, happy election day. There was a uh, great debate back in the 20th century uh, between a uh, public relations guy named Walter Lippmann and an education theorist named John Dewey. Now, Walter Lippmann pretty much invented PR. I mean, the Romans might have known how to influence people, but they didn't think of it as propaganda or public relations. They didn't think of it as a science. They just thought, you know, let's hold some death matches before the election and let the emperor go thumbs up, thumbs down. Everyone's going to like him better now. And maybe they'll, they'll support us in this war or whatever. Um, but they didn't, they didn't really think of it quite as, as a science, as a craft, and as something to be done for democratic purpose. So Walter Lippmann wrote a number of books on propaganda. He was in his early 20s. And he basically came out with the, with the notion that true democracy in the American sense is not really possible, right? Because people are pretty much too stupid to do it. People can never become informed enough to vote appropriately. They can't even be expected to vote in their own interests, much less in the interests of the country. They just can't understand. The people are part of an unruly mass mob thing. And the best we can offer them is the feeling of participation is the, a, a good simulation of democracy and one that feels good enough that they will comply with the policies that we put in effect anyway. So his model for American democracy was you get a few rich people to be the elite who decide how things are, and then they hire the most clever public relations people they could find to get the public to agree with whatever they said. Right? And that was his, that was his model, that, that an elite and a great crafty public relations industry manufactures public consent for what the elite want to do. And in the best of cases, this is a benevolent elite, right? These are smart people who understand that the masses, like children, need to be taken care of, need to be uh, uh, shown why they need to have jobs, they need to be kept in order, and that this is the best we could expect. So John Dewey, who was this aging educator up at Columbia Teachers College, which was around back then in the early 1900s, um, looked at this stuff and went, oh my god, this is insane. You know, that he believed, perhaps naively, that America could be a democracy, that people could be uh, informed enough 
to vote every two years for representatives who would then go and carry out their interests. And that the only obstacle to that really was that people were acting stupid and were essentially uneducated. So he believed that if we educate people properly, right, if we get enough you know, tax dollars into education and look at public schools and develop this stuff better, then the, the, working, the working man could be elevated to the point where he could participate effectively in democracy. So he wrote these great um, rebuttals to Bernays's first books. And Bernays would write back, but not letting anyone know that he was writing back. He would just write, incorporating Dewey's argument, but not even acknowledging that Dewey existed, because that would be to lower himself to some you know, academic argument. But, but uh, Lippmann continued, basically, by saying, look, America needs to be redefined. It is not a democracy by the people. It is a democracy for the people. Right? It's the results that matter that this is a nation really of consumers and government can provide the fruits of democracy to them without risking democracy on them. Why do I bring that up today other than the fact that we had some strange elections? Um, because the argument that they had um, is as yet unresolved. We don't yet know whether we are capable of stewarding our own future. And we don't yet know whether a sizable, uh, even a sizable minority of people want to or are capable of figuring out what the heck is going on in the world around them. Right? I, I agree with Lippmann in that most people don't see the world. Lippmann said most people have pictures in their head, and that's what they look at. And these are pictures that are usually put in by someone or something else, and they don't relate to the actual world around them. And waking them up to the point where they start to see little bits of what's going on in their immediate world and in the greater world and in the big world is really frightening and upsetting to people. It's, it's like, you know, giving them the 10-year Buddhist course in 10 seconds, right, or a DMT trip or something. They're, people don't want to be confronted with the great existential quandaries, and that's why they, they, they um, submit to many of the, the, the illusions that our society has to offer them. What I see when I look at the history of, of culture and technology and computing and media in particular is I see occasional rare opportunities for civilization, the majority of people, to decide to participate in what's going on, for people to actually become what, what in, the, in the 60s we used to call empowerment, right? For people to actually become empowered, for, to exercise agency in their own affairs and in the world around them, to become cognizant of the fact that a whole lot of the world that we live in is a social construction, is made, is not actual, are not pre-existing conditions, but are things that people made for us to function in certain ways. And then usually we let that opportunity go by. Either because, and we don't really know, either because people just look at it and think, it's just too much work. It's just too much responsibility. I really don't want to know. Put me back in the matrix, boy, and don't let me remember this ever happened. Or as I argued in coercion, because there's kind of big bad institutions and mean guys who cover it up or take it away or make us afraid of it. You know, that our hesitance to open our eyes, to put on the Hoffman glasses in They Live, if you know that movie, and see the programming all around you, um, that, that's, that that's because there's bad guys who don't want us to get there. Either way, it's a repeating cycle. You know, 
human beings uh, develop text around, depending on how you count, around 1100, 1300 BC or BCE to be political, which is politically correct now. I don't know. Um, see, it depends which side of the aisle you're on, I guess. Um, they developed text, and we had this thing called the Axial Age, right? Text and farming and things like that. This was the beginning of the trajectory that, that we're talking about today. When people got text, it changed everything. Right? Now they got, well, they got the law once they had text. They changed, I'm saying that because we've got lawyers here, but but we changed our relationship to God from random chaotic obedience to forces we don't even know what they are to this thing called Torah, which is a covenant or a contract. Right? All of a sudden, God's going to be accountable. This is what we do. This is what he does. We've got a contract. Everything changed. We got religion. We got law. We got, we got a different relationship to reality. Right? God says to Abraham, way early in the Bible, he says, uh, you'll be a nation of priests. He's talking about Abraham's offspring. And rabbis have argued for centuries about what that means. And of course, I know what it means. Um, that's Hubris is good for you. Um, what it means is you'll be a nation of people who could read and write. Before text, before the 22-letter alphabet that let Judaism and Christianity happen, there was this stuff called hieroglyphs. What does hieroglyph mean? Priestly writing. Hiero is priest, glyph is writing. Writing was something for an elite. So we got text, and now we're going to write our own laws and give ourselves a Sabbath and respect the worker and do all these terrific things, live consciously. As, as the Hebrews would say, tikkun alam, we're going to heal the earth because now we understand that humans are participant actors in the story of Humanity, that we are part of it. We're, we're going to respond to the call. But what ended up happening with text? Did we get a nation of priests? No. You know, a, a, a thousand or so years later, we still had people who can't read gathering in the town square to hear text read to them by a rabbi. Right? He'd unroll the scroll and read and basically minister the text to them. So an elite gained the capability of the new medium and the masses gained the capability really of the last medium. The masses now were like, well, they had what the Pharaoh had before them. They could basically hear the word of God recited to them. You know, as they said, Pharaoh used to be able to hear God. So now they had the pretext ability and the elite had text. Then the next great media renaissance was what? The printing press. We got the printing press, and what is the bias? What would you think the printing press would do? It would create a nation of writers, right? Now we can write. We've got printing presses. We can disseminate our words to everybody. But what did we actually get in the Renaissance? We got people learned to read, and an elite printed. If a town had a printing press that was unauthorized by the court, they would go in and burn it down and kill the people. That's what they would do because you weren't allowed to have a printing press. So it wasn't just, it wasn't just that people were incapable or unwilling at that point to learn to write. They just didn't, they didn't have, they didn't have the, uh, uh, they weren't granted the access. And now I look at today's great media renaissance and that's the computer. And the capability on offer with this thing, as I see it, is programming, right? When I first saw a computer in seventh grade, it didn't have software in it. It was just a computer. To get it to do something, you wrote a program for it to run. So a computer, we thought of a computer like an anything machine, the way a writer would look at a, at a blank composition book as something where you could actually write your own words into the pages. But I don't feel like we've retained that sensibility. Instead of learning how to program, I feel that most people are really just learning how to write on this thing. Most people use a computer to tweet, Facebook, or at best blog their thinking, their thoughts into the window provided to them by the actual user or programmer of the machine. So what do we get? 
In the 21st century then, we see people seize the media capability that was offered to them in the 13th century. So now we get programming and what do we do? We write. And once again, a small elite learn how to program. Many of whom are in other countries, little brown people that we offshore our programming to because we think of it as some menial task that nice, lazy American consumers wouldn't even want to be bothered with, right? This is like bricklaying or, or plutonium mining or whatever the things that you have other people you don't want to bother with do. What's coding going to do to my brain? And, and so the, the computer renaissance that for me, beginning in the 70s and then my next hit in the 80s and my next hit in the 90s, which to me meant my gosh, finally there's a medium. Finally there's a tool here that's going to reverse the Lippmann equation. Finally now, instead of just being programmed by my television, I have a way to talk back. Finally, I have something more powerful than LSD in that instead of just seeing the world as I imagine it, I can now make the world as I imagine it. I actually have a tool to construct reality from my terminal. And I look 20, 30 years later at where we've gone with it, and I see not only do people not know how to program or want to know how to program, but I feel as if people are unaware of the programming itself, that they don't even know the programming exists, that the computer is not an anything machine through which I make what I want to have happen happen. It's not a machine that does what I want it to do. It is a machine that does what it does. It is a machine that comes with its capabilities. Its capabilities have been predetermined for me. So just like buying a book or buying a DVD, I buy a computer and it has these software things on it and I could buy other ones and put them on there. But the capabilities of the tool are determined for me. Which, I mean, maybe they determine great ones and that's fine. And God bless. But I want people to at least know that the software they're using, the applications they're using, the websites they're going to are not pre-existing conditions of the universe. They're not just like neighborhoods that sprung up naturally or forests or oceans or cities that evolved over time. They are planned communities. They are places with functions. They are embedded with agendas. Right? The difference between a rake and a digital technology is that the digital technology has been embedded with purpose. It is a thing that wants something. It is a program. It is not sitting there. I mean, you can extend this to look at all of our 21st century technologies compared to industrial age technologies. And they are technologies that have purpose, technologies that live on, technologies that replicate, that spread, that alter themselves. Robotics, nano, genetics, and digital all share that feature in that they are self-sustaining, self-replicating, and self-modifying. You set them in motion and they go. But you talk to a kid using Facebook today and ask him, what is Facebook for? And he will tell you, Facebook is here to help me make friends. What will she tell you? If it's a girl? Hey, Facebook is here to help me make friends. Um, there's a problem in the English language when we talk about a person. That you either have a masculine name or a feminine name. There's a bunch of ways to do it. You can alternate then between he and she and he and she, which then gets people thinking about it in the back of their head. You can do they, which I've tried, but they never works because they, you end up enforcing this bad grammar thing of, uh, you know, they is and all that that goes on. What are they? Um, the, the, the fake plural. 
or you can do all she, but then that says something. So then I reverted back to he and said, look, we're speaking basically King's English here, so I do that. Um, but yeah, I get it. Um, I don't do it because I'm evil. I'm doing it because I've accepted the program, right? I've accepted, I've accepted that program. But at least I'm conscious of it. Um, but yeah, ask a kid and they'll say, that's the, what we do today, right? Ask a kid and they'll say, it's there to help me make friends. But you go to the boardroom of Facebook, they're not saying, how are we going to help Janie make friends, right? They're thinking, how are we going to monetize Janie's relationships? How are we going to sell Janie's information to these corporate sponsors? All that. If the kid's not aware of what the program is for, it's very hard for him to use it effectively. And it's not just the kid with Facebook. It's almost everybody. It's companies. It's banks. It's startups. It's educators. It's governments not understanding what the tools they're using have been made for or even that there's a bias in them, or that they could be made differently or done with something else. So, right, so I came up with this, with this little uh, uh, concept of program or be programmed, which I started out meaning it slightly facetiously, and the more I talk about it, um, and the more audiences I've engaged with about this topic, the more I mean it literally. You know, you are either making the software or you are the software. You know, there's really almost no middle ground. You are either participating in the creation of the reality in which we're living, or you're just in it. You know, I, I don't know of a real way to remain conscious of the world without participating actively in the world. In other words, there isn't this place left that I was hoping there would be as an author. There is no sort of non-participant, observer, perfect place, you know, where you can literally see everything that's going on while you stand still. You actually have to be, you're in this one way or the other, and you're either being swept along the current by the current, or you're helping make that current. You know, it's when you're whitewater rafting, right, and the water gets rough. What do you do? Do you slow down? No. You've got to actually, you've got to row more so that you can direct the thing a little bit. Realizing, though, that people don't want to hear they have to know how to program. You know, realizing that people do not want to understand how digital technology works because they've bought the false line that it's hard. Right? I mean, maybe C++ is hard, you know, but Scratch isn't hard, Logo isn't hard, Basic isn't hard. You know, just knowing what the heck is going on here, understanding just a touch about what this is and how it works will change everyone's view of, of what's going on in there, just as you guys are finding out. When you know the history of this stuff, it changes what you think of it. When you find out that, say, SMS messaging was originally just a missed call notification feature that got hacked to send a message instead, people go, oh, well, then you think about what's the bias of that as a form of expression. What is all that? How did that work? How did it build up from that? I mean, everything's a hack of something else. You know, you plug a computer into a phone line, it's like, oh, internet. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it, it is that uh, random sometimes or that intentional. So what I decided to do for, for the majority of people to sort of get them on their way was sort of the same thing that the Torah rabbis did for the, the Israelites who they realized were going to remain illiterate and not participate actively in the creation of their law. You know, they weren't going to sit around the table and write Talmud with them. Um, what they did was they came up with what the, you know, mitzvah or commandments. So I thought why not, two renaissances later, come up with commands? So rather than commands that people have to follow, commands that people can use to literally have command over the medium. Commands just like we give commands to, to our little friends here. Um, and the commands would be based in, in the biases of media. 
And biases of media is really a, a construct that, that I guess McLuhan came up with. You know, that you can understand media in terms of biases and then know a hell of a lot more about what it's for. You know, the idea is that every technology, every medium is biased towards something. Right? I agree that guns don't kill people. People kill people. But guns are more biased towards killing people than our pillows. Right? <laughs> oh, even though you can kill with both. Right? So there's, technologies can be biased towards certain kinds of behavior. So I thought, why don't I help people understand the biases of digital technology compared, as compared to the biases of other things, of things from the industrial age or before that have different, different kinds of biases. And if I help them understand each bias, in other words, which way is it biased along sort of each axis or each dimension of its, of its uh, uh, um, expression in our lives, then we can better know when to use it and when not to use it. When is this thing being used um, according to its bias and when is it being used against its grain and how can I compensate? It doesn't mean you can't use a technology against its bias. You just have to understand that, okay, it's not biased for this, right? So if, if, if we understand, well, I'll get to one. Here's an easy one. And these, for me, they always go back. They're a little bit fractal in that they always go back to the actual texture or makeup of the technology. So time. In the, bi in, the, uh, in the axis of time, I would argue that digital technology is biased towards the asynchronous rather than the synchronous. You know, if you've ever written a computer program, even in basic, it's basically a sequence, right? Step 10, do this. Step 20, do that. Step 30, do this. Step 40, you know, input such and such. When it gets to step 40, input such and such, what does it do? the computer. It sits and waits for the input forever, right? Until this person puts something in. The computer is not living in time. It's living in a sequence. We live in time, but it doesn't live in time, right? And the, the kinds of technologies and software and interfaces I and mean, applications that were built for humans on top of these technologies tended to be asynchronous also. Right, the first great uh, uh, internet discussion board that I was on was called The Well. The conversations we had on The Well, um, they were asynchronous conversations in that you would log onto your computer, you'd plug it into the modem, you'd plug the modem into the phone line, you'd dial into the server, you would download the conversation, you would log off the internet, or it wasn't the internet really yet, you'd log off the server, and then you'd read the conversation. Right? You'd read all these people's posts to what they, and then it would get down to the last one, and you'd read that and think, do I have something to contribute to that? What do I want to say? And you could actually be as smart as you never were before, because unlike the conversation in the classroom or in the real world where you've got to have that comeback, you could take all night to decide what you wanted to say. You could take the next day. You could take two days. It was like chess by mail, where you could think as long as you wanted to about how you were going to enter that thing. And then you'd type in your whole thing. You'd make sure your two paragraphs really sang. And then you'd upload it. So what kind of conversation was that? This was a conversation that actually um, had deeper thinking, more resonance, and, and more time and contemplative value than real life conversation because we worked with the asynchronous bias of the net, the asynchronous feature of the net, just like with email. The beauty of email was that you didn't have to answer it right away. Unlike the phone which rang in your house and made you get up and walk to it and go into the darkness. Hello? I mean, remember you, well, before your time, there was a time when you'd pick up the phone and you didn't even know who was calling. That's the way it used to be. You didn't know who was there. It was just, it could be anybody. It could be your mother. You know, it could be this. I mean, imagine, you know, you're stoned and this and that phone rings. What am I going to do? It could be the boss. Could be, you didn't know. And just this thing ringing in your house that you get nervous. And, I mean, imagine what your dog thinks, right? When you just get up because this bell is ringing. And, you know, oh my, your dog must think, oh, that's here. Um, so it was, a, it was biased very strangely. Email was this great relief because all of a sudden, I'm going to go every night at 6, I think, or 7 after dinner. And I'm going to see what people have to say to me. And they're not even going to be able to see me or watch my reaction when I do it. Right, it was beautiful. 
And what? They had Fender. They could know if you read everything. Now, yeah. Well, now they can know everything. They, well, that, they did? No. Remember you just meant Fender. Finger, they could see if you were there. Yeah. The last time oh, well, yeah, on the well for sure. Yeah. CompuServe, they couldn't do that. But they could see if you were there too, actually. That's a, another story for another day. Um, what, this, what this command is about, do not be always on, is I'm looking at what happens when we take an essentially asynchronous technology and attach it to our bodies in an always on fashion. Right, so we're taking email, the power of which, the bias of which was this asynchronicity, and now we're turning it into a pseudo-synchronous technology that's vibrating every time we get an email or a text or a thing, right? or here more likely. Right? And then we wonder why are people getting what they're calling phantom vibration syndrome. Right? When you think you, something's vibrating on your thigh even though there's no phone even in, in, on your person, you know, why is that happening? It's happening because this is, this is called a maladaption to technology. This is not an adaptation. This is maladaption. This is your nervous system reacting in a, in a, a I would argue, unhealthy way to your misuse of the technology, even because you maybe love it and all that. And then you look at this strange sort of crackberry addiction that happens. You know, are you more productive because you're checking this thing every 10, 15 minutes? Are you, do you just help your relationship with your kid when you, you know, trying to, yeah, I'm playing with you. Uh, yeah, uh -huh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, what is that and why does it happen? It happens because we're using it as an always on technology. It's because we, we, are, it, we it's a self, um, a, a, a self reinforcing loop. I mean, the, the Blackberry is a perfect uh, OCD condition, conditioned uh, response device. You know, just like a one arm bandit or a slot machine, you get sort of 30 or 40 bad messages for every one sort of opportunity for sex or whatever it is that's the good one. And it's that ratio that keeps you coming back. If they were all good or all bad, you wouldn't be checking it like that, right? It's just like the slot machine. You do a whole bunch of bad ones and oh, five quarters. It's that little bit, right? Of course, you put in 30 to get the five, but still, and feel, ooh, that, just that little endorphin release is enough. So yeah, do not be always on. It's just a simple way of looking at that bias. And really what I'm trying to show you is less, is less to sell you on the commands than um, for you guys, because you're students of media and society and, and, and uh, uh, computers and history, is what is the process I use to do this? In other words, how, does, how can you look at the bias of a technology and then build up from that as to what it actually does or what it's for? This is an easy one, just like television, which means what? Remote viewing, television. Digital technology is biased towards long distance communication. It's great for long distance communication. And it's really not as good for short distance communication. Right? So when I go to a classroom and see, which I have many times, kids going into a classroom where they log on to a computer and engage with each other in Second Life. What is that? Right? That's insane. That's insane, especially when they're paying big college tuitions and going to a whole big place and living in dorms. Right? When you think of the amount of investment in getting those bodies into a room, and this room, God knows what this costs. That's why, that's why this school costs a lot. It's the real estate. Right? So imagine taking a great tool for long distance learning and bringing it into the classroom. And then they put it on the front page of their university bulletins. Look at us using technology. And you're, yes, you are using, or technology's using you. Something's using something. So then a simple command, just live, live in person. Right? Which doesn't mean text in, per text in person, just when you're in person you live. Um, choice. A lot of people look at their choices online the way they look at the choices in the supermarket. You know, you can go down the aisle in the supermarket and think, my God, I live in America, look at all the choice I have. Right? There are 200 different bottles, plastic bottles of detergent on this aisle, right? For front loading, top loading, with scent, without scent, the big top, the little top, the concentrated, you know, I, because I live in a democratic country, I can choose whichever one of these corporate manufactured laundry detergents as the solution to my clothes washing needs. Right? The more choice we have, the less it occurs to us that there were and still are other ways even to wash your clothes than buying this thing in the big plastic bottle and pouring it in a machine, a laundromat. There's other ways. 
I mean, some of you probably know, you can go to Whole Foods or whatever and buy those little nuts. Have you seen those things? These little nuts you can throw in and it washes your clothes and it suds and everything, but there's no detergent, no pollution, no ed, no itching, no eczema. It's like, it's not one of the choices, right? A digital environment is all choice. Everything that happens there is choice. That to me is the real difference between analog recording and digital recording. You know, analog recording, you didn't really make the choice. You just have a medium and the needles kind of banged around in there and made, you know, to the, you, then you can recreate it by, by playing it back and making the sound or, or moving or disturbing the, the iron particles on a piece of tape. A digital technology records it in terms of numbers. You end up with a symbol. You end up with a choice. Is that note here or here? It's one or the other. It's one or the other where that frequency ends up being. It's recorded as a numeral. Just as every database, you've got to decide what are the parameters you're going to let people use, right? I mean, tagging and things like that are a little bit different, right? They start to open up sort of bottom-up open choice as opposed to um, the way we usually program. But you've got to program the database, and that's why you go on to any side. Are you male? Are you female? Are you married? Are you single? You know, are you married? Are you looking? What if I'm married and I'm looking? You know, where are the choices for that don't fit into those places. It's, a, uh, it's an environment that's like a snap two grid, if you remember those from, you still use snap two grids in graphics programs? It's where you, know, you, 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 make, you, you have a thing and it's either gonna be here or there, right? You, you, you can't just put it here, right? You can't put it in between unless you go in and then increase the granularity of the thing, but then it's like, well, it's here or here, here or here, right? It's, it's, it's like living in that. You're gonna choose this part or that part, but there's that nothing in between. Right? It's sort of the same as the time thing, where the computers live on the ticks of the clock and human beings live in the spaces in between. Right? The ticks are great. I'm happy they're there. But there's reality is this other thing that's happening between them. So I just say you may always choose none of the above just to let people make people conscious of the fact that you don't have to choose one of the choices that you're given. You know, or in, in the real world, you don't. And when you're com feeling compelled to make a choice between two things, neither of which really are what you're thinking or want, you've got to look and say, why am I being asked to make this choice? And is there a way for me not to make this choice or to make this choice differently? You know, that's really the easiest way to, to debug reality is to stop when it's not working. Right? You guys use it at NYU, it's Blackboard, right? For class, Blackboard sucks, right? It's like awful in so many different ways. But every way, for you guys, every way in which Blackboard sucks is always sucks for a reason. They are not stupid. This is a multi-zillion dollar company making this thing. Blackboard sucks in ways that are specific to help Blackboard, right? To make Blackboard, to make you more dependent on it, to make a school more dependent on it, to work with copyright, to work with patent infringement and all these other things. It is, Blackboard is there to help Blackboard's company dominate academic computing, right? That's what it's for. Again, it's if you know what the program is for, it's so much easier to, to use it or not. When you know what the program's for, at least you can see what the program's for. And once you see it, you're like, oh, I get it. Blackboard is great at what it does. It is great at what it does. It is terrible at helping students and teachers interact in a meaningful way. It's not what it's for. Um, so it's just a few, I'll just bang through some because uh, uh, I'd like to have some conversation with you. Um, complexity, I just talk about the, the necessary reduction in complexity in a digital environment. That digital environments and digital tools get more complex as people get more simple. Right, that's the, that's the bias. They get easier to use, but harder to program, right? Easier, easier to use in that your, your, your choice, you're, you're pushed further and further away. And every time you interact, remember, every time you interact with digital technology, technology is learning more about you. I don't mean this in a negative anti-privacy way, although it applies there too. Technology is learning about you, right? How often when you interact with technology are you learning about it? Right? More and more and more of the things we do in digital environments. Fewer and fewer of them are ones where we learn about that environment. And more and more of them are ones where that environment learns about us. Sometimes because it loves us and wants to help us. Um, five, scale. One size does not fit all. And this is really, I mentioned more for 
businesses than people. There's this sense online that everything you do has to scale up. Right? Whenever you're trying to start a business, someone who's going to give you money is say, well, how does it scale? How does it scale? And there's this sense that if whatever you're doing then in this life is not scaling, then it's not real. Right? If you're doing something in a town, making some difference, it's like, well, now I've got to make the website that shows everyone else how to make that difference. Or I've got to make the website that aggregates everyone who's making that difference and connects them all. You know, almost every do-gooder who I talk to who discovers the web wants to create the meta do-good site. Right? How are we going to help? Well, I'm here to help all the people who want to do good things really learn from each other and converse about the good things they're doing and da-da-da. If as many people did good things as wanted to help people do good things by providing them with the tools they need to do them, the world would, all the world's problems would have been solved long ago. Um, identity, be yourself. And this has turned into a controversial one. Um, I think anonymity online, for the most part, sucks. Um, because... Um, it leads to a media environment where your identity is your liability. You know, when the 4chan kids or whatever, one of these groups gets angry at me for something I've written, what is their weapon against me? My identity, right? Me, the picture of my daughter, the house I live in, the phone number of my mother, that, the stuff that could be tied to me. My identity is my liability. What's their strength? Their anonymity. Right? The fact that they're not there. Right? The, the, the issue online, it's very hard to be yourself already online. Not just because there's people who are going to be mean, but because you're not really there. Right? 93% of human communication, at least until a few years ago, 93% of human communication occurs non-verbally. 7% happens with the words. So what happens when you're living in an environment now where you only have that 7% to go on? That's not you. That's your 7%. The 93% of you is, is wondering, what did he mean by that text? You don't get the cues. And, you know, God bless, you can go with a QuickTime VR, whatever, chat, Skype, video window thing, and now you think you're seeing the other person, but you're not. You're seeing a two or a four inch video of the other person. Do you see when that person's irises are getting bigger or smaller? Do you see any of the real nonverbal cues? Maybe another 5% of them, but you don't really see them. So now your body is looking at this other face and not getting the cues that it's used to getting when that person says the things that they're saying to you. So all of a sudden your mirror neurons, which are there and ready and hardwired and programmed to release your dopamines and your endorphins when the other person's pupils get bigger and agrees with you, you're not getting that same response. So now what do you do? Well, do they agree with me or not? Do they, uh, uh, now you're insecure. Now you're in that strange, now you're in that strange way. So it's very hard to be yourself anyway. We basically all have Asperger's online. That's what it's like for a person with Asperger's. They can't read the cues. They don't really know what the other people are feeling. I mean, that's a nerve-wracking sensation. That's why we get so mean. That's why we lash out. That's why we like to be anonymous and say mean things in the comments fields of other people's blogs. Um, social. This is simple. Don't sell your friends, right? The, the, the net is social. It's always been social. It's been biased towards social. That's why what was supposed to be a defense department tool ended up having so much gossip and fun on it that they just gave it up and they just wanted to give it to AT&T and AT&T didn't want it because they think look, people are just gossiping and telling stories on this thing. There's never any money in here. I mean, the, the net keeps fighting off every effort to take it over, whether it's big business or the military or this or that. None of those work because people just want to use it to socialize. That's the, the, that's the killer app, if you will, of the net is being social, I don't mean Facebook, that's not social, um, is, is actually to socialize, to connect, to make contact with other people. The reason why people get nervous on Facebook is not that their privacy is being looked at. Who really cares? I mean, they know it already anyway. They already did. You know, before computers, they had the files on you. You know, they look at the history, the Claritas and Axiom and all these, they used to just do it on note cards. How many cats you have, what car you drive, what you bought, how much money you make. It was called direct marketing, and they, they had this before the machines. What makes people nervous on Facebook is that their friendships are being monetized. 
It's that your social connections are, there's value that's being extracted from them that you're not participating in. Unless, of course, you participate in it, and that feels even cruddier. Fact. This is an easy one. Tell the truth. I think that the net is biased towards facts and away from myths. I don't think it's a good storytelling medium, at least not yet. Certainly in social media. It's not about people sharing, making up. You know, you've watched all these efforts that artists have tried to do. Oh, we're going to do this collaborative storytelling thing, and we're all going to get on here. And, you know, that's not really what happens. What, what spreads online is... Who did Tiger Woods have sex with? What happened on his cell phone? What is this? What scandal happened with this company? It's always fact-based. And there was a lot, of, a lot in, this, in this particular chapter for, for companies, sort of helping them see that advertising is kind of dead and people don't want to know about Keebler elves making cookies. They want to know what's in the cookie. Um, openness, this is just my answer to the whole copyright blah, blah, blah thing. Just share, don't steal. Right? In the real world, the reason why we're not stealing is not because we can't steal. We don't steal because we have some sense of social contract. Right? You could steal stuff from you could steal stuff from this room. You could take something. Right? This mouse. You, you could take the monitor. Well, who wants this monitor these days anyway? But you could. I mean, you could, take, you could take someone's iPhone. I mean, there's stuff around that you could get away with. And you don't because you don't, right? So it's, it seems pretty easy. Share when you can, because yes, this medium is biased towards sharing, but don't steal. And in there, I sort of argue about the sort of false bias of Google and openness and open source. You know, Google pretends that he just wants us to be open and sharing and loving and all that. Google is still extracting value from all that sharing, right? So in the old days, maybe evil Rupert Murdoch would hire me to write a book, and I would write it, and you'd have to pay for it, but at least I'd be cut in on the profits. Now, Google wants me to write a book and give it to you for free, and they're still making the money. They're still extracting value from my labor, right? It's just they're not cutting me in on it. And finally, lastly, purpose, program or be programmed, which is, you know, the sort of the object of the game. You know, that, I, that, that if, and the bias is purpose. I just want people to understand that the tools have purpose embedded in them, right? Not just in their structure, but in their ongoing function that these tools have purpose. And once you know what the purpose is, first you're going to be more likely to use it effectively. right? Even if you're going against its original purpose, at least you're going to now say, OK, I'm not using this tool. I'm now going to hack Facebook to find friends, you know, which is a much easier way to think about it than um, use it, because it's not there to help you do that. Um, or hack, you know, SM, uh, hack a, a, a lost message notification to send messages to people so th until the point where it becomes the, the feature. Or better, to actually learn how to do this. In other countries, they teach programming to kids. They really do. You know, in, in Korea, South Korea, it starts by about second grade now they're teaching programming to kids. Now, that might be a little early. I mean, they're, they're, they're aggressive. But certainly by fourth grade, by the time a kid has learned the long division algorithm, they know everything they need to to do basic programming. It's not crazy. This is easy. You know, and then I talk to the generals. I talk to the CEOs. Everybody's got kids coming in who are really good at video game playing, kids who want to fly drones and blow things up, but nobody coming in, no recruits who know how to program, who know basic crypto. Right, so what happens in a generation when you've got one American kid going into the military with programming knowledge for every thousand going into Chinese, the Chinese army with, with programming knowledge? I mean, read the writing on the wall. It is so over, right? We just have to hope they're benevolent, right? That they're, that they're as benevolent as we were, right? Um, I know, it's like... That's what I, the one thing I would advise people in, in sort of global leadership on the West is be as nice as possible. Be as nice as you can be from now till the expiry date, right? So it's like, oh, no, we're actually friendly people. Because um, otherwise, you know, it's that old Thomas Jefferson, the wolf by the ears thing. And, you know, when do you let go? You're going to go, nice, wolf. He was talking about slavery, why you, why you couldn't stop slavery. It's like, it's like having a wolf by the ears. Um, but yeah, I don't think, I don't think that uh, we have a wolf by the ears in, in, in the sense that I think we are the wolf. You know, we are the thing. We are the same people that are everywhere else. And we are just as woefully unaware of the programs 
that are operating on us. You know, I, I feel like we are just running programs without knowing what they're for and without any uh, desire, much less ability, to code, to write them. Coding is not this awful geek thing. Coding is this wonderful geek thing, but coding is literally programming the future of our species. The technologies we have now, we can remake human biology, we can remake consciousness, we can literally build the world in which we live consciously from many, many tiny high remote leverage points. And uh, to pass up that opportunity would not just be a shame, but I think to pass up that opportunity may be the last time we get to make this choice. The window of opportunity opened really with the invention of text. It opened again with the printing press and broadcast, which we misused. And it's open now with these technologies. I, I believe that if we do not seize the opportunity here that uh, either someone or something else will end up doing it, doing it for us. Okay, we've got like five minutes for some, some interaction. Um, shall we? Do you guys have thoughts, questions, concerns, anything? We could talk about other things. We could talk about Psychic TV and uh, Life Inc. or anything else, you know, stage, stage fight choreography. Yeah. So I brought a bunch of law students here who also study policy and government uh, activity. Uh, other than just reforming the American educational system, are there initiatives that policymakers or new emerging advocates can do to reform government, to work with legislatures, to work with any agencies to try to stave off or promote America's ability to uh, program, to create a new generation of programmers? Um, well, yeah, education's a good one. I know Obama's kind of, you know, uh, considering it. It's so hard to do these things centrally, you know, because it's such a big country. It's like way easier for South Korea to say, let's teach computers in all of our, you know, however many they have. Let's say a thousand, you know, uh, uh, grammar schools than our zillion. And then when we've got like, oh, computers don't exist, you know, because God isn't there, people and whatever, you know, there's just like, uh, it's very hard to do, to do anything. Um, I would, uh, there's a few things. Um, first, uh, in, the, in the political arena, po politicians have gotten very good at using interactive technologies to run campaigns, but they're still really bad at using technology to run government or to get any sort of feedback or to, to do, and you know, and I went to the New York Tech Meetup last night, and there's people coming up with some ideas, but most of them are, are still more gimmicky than they are just easily effective. I think people in America no longer understand the point of representative democracy. I think they've really lost that. They think, well, is this guy supposed to be my daddy or is he supposed to be my, my errand boy? And they're sort of stuck between the two. They don't, they don't get it. Um, and partly uh, one problem with them not getting it is they think everything then should be a direct referendum to them that they should just be able to go and go click yes, no, as if they're informed about these issues. Sort of the, remember Ross Perot's dream of uh, electronic democracy, uh, where if you really thought about it for long, you'd realize, oh my God, that would be such a nightmare to have 200 million or 300 million people voting on every policy every day. You know, so then, okay, gays can't be married this month, and ah, gays are gonna get married next month, because the guy in American Idol, we all like him, so gay's not so bad. You know, it's just, it would be, it would be a wreck. You know, that government is great because it helps to govern you know, these, these swings. So civics um, would be a great thing to restore, would that be it? Um, so yeah, certainly uh, uh, electronic government. Um, money, you know, I think the way to do it is, uh, the way to get things happening in America is fear. You know, and that's why I, I play with these two memes in the 10th in the command of look, our military superiority and our, our economic superiority are a great peril. I've got quotes from like three, an Air Force general and an Army general and a Navy admiral all saying, within one generation, we will have lost our technological superiority to the East, that it's inevitable, you know, that I can't keep, I can't keep the computer safe anymore, 
that the botnet is here. I don't know what it does. It's going when they turn it on all hell's going to break loose. You know, I've talked to the heads of the Treasury Department who are saying, don't worry, we have backups in near Salt Lake City that the Mormons are keeping for us. Right, that that's what, that basically what they're going to do when it hits. What they think is it's going to hit like the, um, the banking system. So the idea is that when it hits, they're just going to go back to the last moment that they've got on Rick. And, they're, and the thing they're getting really good at is recording it sooner and sooner. So it was like taking a snapshot at like midnight the night before. So they'll just do global reset to the day before. And now they're getting it more. So it could be like the hour before, which would be less disastrous than having to reset one day. But um, they're just like, they, they consider it an inevitability. So they're using, they're marshalling what technology resources they have to gird for technological collapse rather than using what resources they have to, to, uh, uh, to elevate. But yeah, I think when you do it, though, then you get kind of a Sputnik, like, uh, remember when Sputnik, yeah, and no, of course not, um, there was this thing that the Russians shot up, the first satellite, it was called Sputnik. And when it went up, this was in the 60s, um, or late 50s even, people got really afraid that the Russians were going to have military and psychological superiority, and they published news reports where they said the Russians intended to paint a sickle on the moon. For, and Americans were going to have to look up at that every night. And that's how they helped get America behind the idea of teaching calculus in high school and, and having engineering programs and doing all this, all this stuff that then, um, it's why we had world leading math and science, you know, until the late 70s. We were really the leaders in that stuff. Um, I forgot who was, yeah. Uh, your argument reminds me a bit of the work of M. Langdon Winter, who wrote sort of famous article in the 80s called Do Artifacts Have, Pol Artifacts have Politics? And in that he tries to sort of, I'm curious at one point or another, in that he tries to sort of play out the question of whether it's the underlying social and economic relations which are really sort of dictating the way you know, these things happen, which seems to be sort of your Facebook, I think. Right. Or is it something that, which is internal to the technologies itself, which would be kind of like a you know, wiki versus SharePoint argument? So I'm just wondering, where you come down on that, because you've obviously sort of emphasized, it seems to be the external social relations argument, but is there something about the technologies themselves which are inherently you know, sort of liberatory or not? Depends on the technology. I mean, in general, um, all technologies give us more choices. All of them. That was what they were for. When the invention of fire let us choose to live in caves, you know, uh, up in the up in the colder parts of the, the the world, you know, so the little smart monkeys who had fire could run away from the big, scary monkeys who didn't have fire, right? So we could get into little cold places and and develop. Um, so all technologies have that, but all technologies also have the burden of choice. You know, they force more choice. Um, in an ideal world, you know, you get to live like the Amish. And it's not that they don't have technology. They're absolutely dependent on technologized society. They just don't bring it in to where they live. In other words, the tools that they use tools that have been developed by people using other technologies just so they don't, in other words, so they don't have to use it themselves. You know, and then slowly, but over time, they end up really incorporating those technologies anyway, just 50, 60, 70 years later after they've seen kind of how they impact um, the rest of the world. So kind of in an ideal world, you want everyone else using those technologies, every technology, and you not. Right? You want everyone else to have cell phones and you not to have to have one. Um, it's hard to live like that. But yeah, could you imagine everyone has email, but you don't have to? It's, then you kind of have that perfect. It's just like, um, I mean, think of it with vaccines, sort of the easiest way to think about it. The, in an ideal world, everyone else's kid in the class has the vaccine against the disease, and yours doesn't. Why is that good? Because now your kid won't catch it because there's no one spreading it, and they have all the problems of having had to have been vaccinated, right? So they have the immune system uh, uh, problems that you get, you know, through vaccinations or whatever's wrong with the, uh, uh, the preservatives. Um, so I'd argue both. It's both nature and nurture. So in this book, I talk about digital technology that because it's asynchronous or because digital recordings are actually sampled, that they are fundamentally different 
than, say, an analog recording. So they have intrinsic biases, but then there's also, of course, the social biases. The less we know about them, then the more those social biases affect us. Yeah. If we're asking the question, is it the artifact or the underlying technological social relations? And as you yourself pointed out, as technology evolves, it becomes much more complex and instead of in relationships and contrast between you know, race, you can carry on and break these anywhere. And a digital computer, which relies on a complicated network and a complicated set of sociological rules, right. to do with it, then it becomes almost a false question. You see that as technology evolves, it becomes inherently more political but almost impossible to find this politics by abstracting the artifact because you can't. It's part of the thing. The train plays on this himself, you know, the computer by itself sitting there. You know, it, you, you can't. It's very hard to discuss if that is that computer. Is that a right wing or a left wing computer? Right. No. But now because the technology bubble becomes so interconnected, we can talk about the network effects of technology. Right. Right. Which is why you need you ultimately need what you'd call a, a media ecological view. You know, it's what Postman and, and, and McClellan call media ecology to understand these things. They're, they're living in relationship to one another. You know, and there's sort of the scientific uh, division of uh, the extraction of thing to understand it almost doesn't work anymore. Yeah. Talking about um, the social aspect, you said that you didn't consider Facebook part of that. What do you mean by that? I mean that I don't believe that Facebook is genuinely social. I think of Facebook as, I don't, I've experienced social connection online, you know, whether it's through email. And, and I, I feel like the thing that drives still today my internet participation is that social sense of connecting, making contact with others. And Facebook doesn't feel like a contact space. Facebook, it always feels as if contact is made through a third thing. We both like this or through that. It's, um, uh, it's much more, it feels much more like watching TV um, not with somebody, but there's someone else watching the same piece of TV at the same time, as opposed to conversation. Yeah. Because you've been privileged, I don't mean that in a perjurative sense, but I mean that you've experienced less media technologies and precursor technologies that gave rise to this, but you have a whole generation that never experienced that, and for them, it's absolutely social, and I think they're, they're voting with their, with their keystrokes. For them, it is a way of connecting. And, and so my question to you then is, you know, having having experienced kind of like a bigger picture mm. in where all this comes from and trying to deliver this message, what is the canary? What is, I mean, it's a it's, it's really great kind of broad takeaway, but what I'm, lack, what I'm sensing a lack here is a lack of uh, virality or even virality, like the thing that's really going to get late because if in fact technological evolution is causing the systems to become more complex and people to become simpler, choosing convenience and what's easy and social and not, you know, not planning for the long term and that's the kind of your horizons of value constrict, then where is what's I don't want to say sound, what's the what's the what's the viral message that people are that's really going to carry beyond this room that people are going to reverse that flow? Because it seems to me what you're saying is, you know, it's, it's like more people should do what, you know, like the elites are doing. But that requires more effort and more time. Right. We don't go there. That's why you say, look, this is a difficult world. Your kids are going crazy. Your school isn't using this stuff right. Here's 10 simple commands, just like seven habits of highly effective people. The digital world is difficult and dangerous. You're confused. You're tired. You spent all this money. Your, your kid wants to jailbreak his iPhone. Is that against the law? And what does it mean? And how do you deal? Should you limit their screen time? Let them play games? What do you do? Don't worry. I'm an important media theorist. I've looked at all this. I understand all the research. Here's 140 pages, 10 simple rules that you can use to evaluate when you're implementing something. And then they do it for that reason. It's just going to make my life easier. I'm going to do this. And slowly but surely, if they're sort of following these lines of thought, they end up becoming new media literate. They end up understanding that, oh, it matters where this came from and how this works. You know, oh, maybe it is good for Junior to take a programming class rather than just a Microsoft Office class. You know, that what I'm trying to encourage parents in this sense is rather than limit their kids' exposure to the technology, is push them through to the, to the other side of the screen. Let them understand what it really is. Um, but yeah, I'm over, you know, I'm over the, the, the meme cultural, oh, well, here I'm going to do, I'm not here to... Uh, uh, manifestoize yeah, reality. Like, yeah. You know, the, the, the meme that's yeah. going to work the magic. I just mean if it's a natural propensity of people to want to do things that are easier, 
and if technology is making it easier for the centralization of intelligence, you don't have to think about this. This right. huge system we've created thinks about it for you. You know, it seems to me it's a, outside of the, you know, small group of, you know, privileged, educated, you know, kind of inspired, smart people. It's kind of, it's kind of a hard battle. Yeah, well then let me even, then let me even convince that small privileged group of elites to think. Because, you know... Who wants to jailbreak his phone? Isn't that a good stuff? Yes. Not being programmed? Absolutely. That's why I want those people to read this book. Because they're panicking about Junior jailbreaking his phone. And if they look and they say, then they'll notice, say, well, Junior, why are you jailbreaking your phone? Well, Junior, the reason I'm jailbreaking my phone is Janie Jr. Um, is because I bought an iPhone and I and 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 I have an iPad and the iPad has been disabled so that it can't go through the iPhone to get online when it's supposed to and we're already paying ten dollars a month for tethering and uh, that sucks and it's wrong and we own this and it's actually completely ethical for me to do that and then the parent goes oh you know <laughs> can we get in trouble you know, is that the same as LimeWire, where the guy that owns $1.6 trillion now, because he, you hear that? He owns $1.6 trillion for um, the guy who, who was the like, CEO of LimeWire. Yeah, they, they, came, they came to the judgment against him. They said he's liable for every uh, file that was shared. So I thought, wouldn't it be fun to, um, if someone want to do it, just, just let me know if you do, to start, let's do a Kickstarter for him. To say, we want to raise $1.6 trillion to pay his fine, to pay the judgment. It'd just be cute. Um, yeah, we got to run. You got to give back papers too and do all that. It's like at one forty. Let's do one more. Yeah. yeah. I just wanted to go back for a second to the point you made at the beginning that every new sort of paradigm shift, the elite always end up with the tools that could be used for you know like mass freedom. So, but it seems to me like technological literacy is increasing, um, and more people, even though. Many people are choosing the easy way out. At the same time, many more people are also learning how to program. Even if it's not in the US, it is in China, it is in South Korea. So my question is, could you see that sort of the pyramid shifting and, and then sort of the people that have been governed and have been under control are now a majority that knows how to, like you said, you know, create the world that they live in? And sort of what would that look like? I I certainly hope so. I mean, it's funny. First, I looked at the internet as, okay, this is where the counterculture is going to go, because it's where we went, to create this new reality and do this thing. Um, and screw them, let them have their, their shitty world. We're going to build this other thing. And you know, that's when you've got the sort of second life, Philip Rosedale, um, this, this sort of utopian vision for the net. Then the net became all corporatized, and as the environment started to collapse, I, then I thought, well, why don't we let them all have the net and we could take the real world. Let, you know, all the <laughs> companies go on there and live in, in the virtual land and we get the real world back. Um, I do think there's some possibility of that. Um, and, and I don't want to be unhappy about uh, another civilization getting a chance to lead, right? And right, right now, I don't like the way the Chinese civilization is being run. It feels like a repressive kind of society to me. But um, over the 100 or so years it'll take for that shift to happen, um, you know, things could change there, you know, quite radically. But it doesn't, it doesn't feel to me as yet that it's, that it's, um, I, I would love, I want to, I want to, I'm going to choose for the rest of the day to believe that what you're saying is true. Right? That, and, and it all depends on which figures you use. That there are more people learning about computers. That these languages like Scratch that are coming out are really easy to use. That Google, Android, you know, the app builder is so simple and so motivating for someone to say, oh my gosh, I can make an app and upload it to the store and millions of people can see it. That it does. If people, if kids start looking at Google Apps the way you know, the high school kids today look at a YouTube video, um, then yeah, then the whole thing can flip. You know, and then it's just a matter of understanding enough about the context in which this stuff is happening to, um, you know, to build stuff that serves us rather than just, you know, whatever server we're uploading it to.
Can we I got a weird. Last one, just before you go. Is yeah, yeah. Available only via OR books. Would you like to just talk about the publishing model? Yeah, I mean, it's actually now it's secretly available other ways. The idea was um, to make the book cost less, right? To do a book for $16 instead of $28. And the reason why books cost so much is because you've got to give the bookstore 60% of the books, right? So Amazon takes 55% of the price of the book. And it's like, is 55% worth people clicking there? In other words, Amazon has a search box. It's a good search box, and they can search and find the book. Or they can put the book into the Google search box or the Yahoo search box and get to this site and get the book and not pay the 55%. Um, so it seemed, let's try it and do it like this. Have it being what it is, many people would rather, maybe they're just rich, you know, they would rather spend significantly more for the ease of use of Amazon than type in their name and address and credit card again at some other publisher site. Or, pay, or PayPal through the publisher site. Um, but yeah, the idea was if this is a genuine peer-to-peer -peer economy or a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace, then why do we need that aggregator? Why can't I just out-aggregate Amazon? What value are they really creating for me here? They're not, you know, in this case. Hmm? Ubiquity. Yeah, ubiquity. Ubiquity and habit. But Google's just as ubiquitous. So why can't we use Google Books and let people find books that way and then just click on um, where the book came from? You know, or you could create ubiquity, ubiquity at a cheaper price. I could just create, yeah. Books aren't found, they're suggested. Yeah, but they're, Amazon isn't a suggestion engine anymore, really. No, no. And even then, is it so why can't we do that without them? You know, without Bezos, yeah. Oh, we're over, we're over the time yeah. that we have of the room, yeah. And you still have more business to do. So thanks a lot for coming.